Good evening, everybody. I'm Will Knoll. I'm the director of the Kislak Center and the Schoenberg Institute for Manuscript Studies. And it falls to, to me to introduce the third and final 2017 ASW Rosenbach Lecture in Bibliography to be delivered by Mary Carruthers, as my colleague David McKnight, chair of the Rosenbach Committee, has succumbed to the flu. Before I move on, Peter Stalibras has a presentation to make. <laughs> um, the Penn Manuscript Collective uh, every year makes a t-shirt. And this year the t-shirt is made in your honor, so it's from a book of memory. This is the first one. It's, uh, it's the prototype. Uh, so uh, the prototype actually is from a book of memory uh, printed in Venice in, in, um, in 1485. Thank you, Anne. Anne Duckling out here it makes one every year. But this one is specifically made in honor of you. Great, thanks, Peter. Um, before moving on further tonight, I should very briefly mention next year's series. Um, one of Penn Library's most wonderful artifacts is a lovely informal account book of a miller, MS Codex 1418, with entries from the late 15th and early 16th century. It's the sort of book that might have been in the hands of Menocchio, the miller whose readings got him into such trouble with the Inquisition, because among other difficulties, he took the idea of spontaneous generation a little too seriously. Menocchio is famously the subject of Carlo Ginzburg's The Cheese and the Worms, The Cosmos of a 16th Century Miller. The Rosenbach Committee is delighted to announce that next year we move from the high Middle Ages into Ginzburg's slightly more recent world when he presents the 2018 Rosenbach Lectures. Yay. We have learned so much from Mary Carruthers over the last three days, and I have no doubt we will learn more tonight. As Rita Copeland and Roger Chartier have pointed out, Mary's subject is the mind, mens memoria est. And this is why her work is of such interest to medievalists of all subject areas, and indeed her writings have an importance way beyond the confines of the Middle Ages. The timing of her lectures could not be better for Penn, with our new faculty hires in medieval history, music, and art history, and the growing sense of community among medievalists and early modernists at Penn. When we come together, as we do tonight, there are indeed a lot of us, and we all have something to learn. It has also been such a great pleasure to host Mary here for the last three days. She's looking pretty good for a Rosenbach lecturer on her third day. <laughs> By when most Rosenbach lecturers have had their brains pretty well picked and their body, we hope, pretty well pickled. From morning to night by an intellectually and physically greedy Philadelphia audience. Thank you so much, Mary. It's been a great pleasure, as well as an education, to host you here. Thank you. The subject of Professor Carruthers' lectures is cognitive geometries using diagrams in the Middle Ages. On Monday, she discussed geometry and the topics of invention. On Tuesday, the shapes of creativity won trees, towers, buildings. And tonight we get a second dose of those marvelous creative shapes, this time hands, spheres, and cubes. Please join me in welcoming Mary Carruthers to give the third and final of the ASW Le Rosenbach Lecturers 2017. I guess I do look good, but I tell you, looks are sometimes deceiving. <laughs> You'll also notice that I've changed the uh, title of this particular lecture to stress the um, solid geometry shapes, so cubits, rotundities, and prisms. Uh, I don't mean to suggest at all that, uh, as you know, I don't believe that flatness is a particular uh, quality of any productive diagram. Uh, which I was trying to uh, elucidate a bit last Tuesday, and we'll go on with that particular topic uh, even more so tonight. I'm going to make you work, just warning you. 
It's been observed for a long time by Fritz Saxel, Harry Bober, Michael Evans, and many other scholars that during the 12th century, especially around Paris, there developed a fashion for elaborate painted diagrams and that this genre exploded, to use Saxel's language, after the middle of that century. The intriguing question is why? Explanations have centered on demographic changes involving Paris and Oxford, especially an increasing institutionalizing of the universities, responding in part to a newly invigorated pastoral and pedagogic mission for clerical renewal as well as lay reform. And historians have also tended to understand 12th century developments primarily as, as prequels to 13th century maturities. Undoubtedly, there is much truth in all of this. I want now, however, to consider the phenomenon as a development from within clerical literary cultures, centered in the language arts of grammar, dialectic, and rhetoric, and in particular, concerned with contemplative envisioning, the practice of rationally directed envisioning and deliberately composed visiones as tools of meditation and contemplation at all but the most exalted of levels. Okay. Just to remind you. I also want to give you a word of caution. 12th century visionaries carefully distinguish between their composed envisioning, which they term visio, and address in a pastoral mode to human audiences, small and large, and divine revelation, or revelatio. This latter is a direct unveiling of divinity instigated by God, such as St. Paul experienced on the road to Damascus when he was caught up into the third heaven. Revelatio is entirely a gift from God. It is always described as very rare, and as in Paul's case, it cannot be directly communicated because human knowledge is entirely inadequate to do so. Translators like Grover Zinn are careful to, to have preserved this important distinction, translating visio as vision or speculation, and revelatio as showing or indeed revelation. And I also recommend the excellent discussion of just this point by Bernard McGinn in his The Flowering of Mysticism, uh, one of the uh, volumes, I think, I think it's the third volume of his uh, History of Mysticism. I've already observed that medieval scholars' classifications of their diagrams emphasize shape over both content and audience. And I've linked these, this to the use of logical topica, the sedes argumentorum, which you see here, uh, as the basic tool of invention well known in medieval learned traditions from Stoic teaching, Cicero, and especially from Boethius, whose De Differenti East Topicis was an essential text in monasteries, cathedral schools, and universities. The topics are always defined with greater or lesser detail in every discussion of the liberal arts from Cassiodorus, whose definition you see in this particular manuscript page, from Cassiodorus through Isidore and Probanus and onward, including Hugh of St. Victor's great Didascalicon, where Cicero's Topica is named as the originary Latin text for inventing and arguing dialectic and rhetoric. My point is that medieval authors did not need to wait on universities or a full translation of Aristotle in order to learn methods of inventing arguments via topical locations. In other words, by various confirmations of logically related geometries. This is, of course, why Hugh of St. Victor quoted a definition of the topics that since antiquity had been housed with dialectic in his characterization of geometry. In the early 12th century, the, sorry, the, the early 12th century gave birth to a number of remarkably complicated examples of such envisionings, really encyclopedic in scope. To us, they, these seem so detailed in their imagining, so precise in their articulations, and so multiple in the shapes that they include in their design, 
that we can scarcely credit them except with the aid of computer-generated design software. And indeed, at least one of these encyclopedic works, Hugh St. Victor's Envisioning of Noah's Ark, has been computer modeled, though with different interpretations, by at least two of its modern students, Conrad Rudolph and Grover Zinn, the, 20, the 2001 edition by Patrice Sicard comes with a separate volume of specially commissioned images. This is in the uh, Corpus Christianorum series. Notably, however, there are no graphic realizations of it that are contemporary with Hugh himself, nor to be found in the 85 manuscripts that still exist into which he scribes copied Hugh's De Descriptio Arche or De Pictura Arche, as several of the manuscripts have titled it. The manus this manuscript in Cambrai is the only one that has any sort of drawing at all. And yet, Hugh's verbal description is made up of lively imaginings in full color of a great many common diagrammatic shapes in addition to the basic ge geometric cubit from which the structure is modularly constructed by Hugh, there are ladders, a map of Mundi, a historical timeline, trees, books, many various figures moving or standing within these shapes. At one point, Hugh instructs his readers to raise the structure by pulling up on the central cubit so that the mobile bands that he describes extending to the sides from under the central cubit also draw up, and the whole structure is pulled from the flat plane into an elevation in a manner that the arc was usually depicted at this time. So in the Cambrai manuscript, these are, this here is the basic <coughs> pictura, if you will, that Hugh describes in his uh, in his treatise, and he describes two bands coming underneath. The central cubit is here, it has a cross on it, uh, and it also has an alpha and omega, etc. Um, and this is the unit of measurement for the whole thing. And then he says there are bands running underneath the arc, uh, both horizontally and also vertically. And you have to pull up on this central <coughs> form so that the bands come up and it turns into an elevation. Now, <clears throat> over on the right-hand side uh, is the modern rendition uh, made for Patrice Sicard's uh, edition. And the modern rendition is probably clearer to us, which doesn't surprise me in the least and shouldn't you. So let's just use that as our imaginative experiment, shall we? For those of you who know this text, the diagonals in the, uh, can, be, um, can visualize the ladders uh, that Hugh imagines that emerge from the four corners of the ark. He describes this a bit later uh, after he has elevated uh, the plan. So, using your imagination, pull the central cubit that is shown in the right-hand diagram straight up from the first, from the flat page. Okay, just pull it up. Here it is. Did you get it there? Is it there? Yeah, it's, I it's, can't it's see too it. Low. Yeah, go, go up, oh, yeah. up, point up with that. That's not fine. Oh, there it is. Okay, right. So this central cubit here is a sort of like what I had to do in the first lecture. Just pull that up off the page. Mm -hmm. And you can see how the thing will rise up underneath that central cubit, largely along the diagonals. Diagonals are very important. <clears throat> so as it pulls up, it becomes a three-storied structure. Notice that the Cambrai manuscripts Badapage sketches which are made using the incised lineation of the manuscript page itself, are no more than outlines, simple aids for a reader who might need some help with his mental seeing. But Hugh fills his verbal text picture with proliferating details for us to imagine within this structure. Sometimes the details are placed within the structure seen in elevation, 
Sometimes it is again regarded as a flat plane. Our perspective has to fluctuate. The quadrangular three-storied arc itself is all enclosed in Hugh's text within a great mandorla, a sh mandorla shaped roundness, a rotunditas, that as well includes the celestial spheres, the ranks of the angels, and the divine majesty. It is, Hugh says, an envisioning of monastic life and of the church within the divine to be built up within oneself by contemplation. Its pedagogy resides in his intention that, a re that it be re-envisioned over and again by those who study the text picture together with his thoughts on monastic life. So there are two treatises, actually. There's a long treatise, which is uh, De, De, uh, De Arca Noe, it's now known as. And that is the meditation on monastic life. And then attached to it is something that is often called De Pictura Arche. It's described as a libellus, which I would ordinarily translate as something like a pamphlet. It has to do with the um, the, the relative ephemerality or, or, or permanence of the particular book. And they usually come together. There's some manuscripts where it is separately uh, copied, but most manuscripts, the two come absolutely together. And in his libellus, in his little uh, pamphlet description, his pictura, he casts this pictura throughout in the present tense. I pingo, meaning I paint, scribo, I describe, and why the movements within it are also always given in the present tense. Hugh does not present his arc as a completed product for others to admire, but rather for his community of canons to use as a machine, as an ars inveniendi, as Cicero terms the topics, for freshly composing via the well-known techniques involving various configurations of your own made sedes argumentorum and cues to your learning. It's your own composing activity that counts. It's a means to the fashioning of your soul, which is really the only product that truly matters. And I've given you this text on the handout of texts here. Uh, so this is number H on there. And now we place, I'll just read the, the, the English. Um, and now we place before you the pattern of this our arc, as we promised, that we are picturing on its outside, that from the outside you may learn what you should do inwardly, so that with the form of this exemplar in your heart, you will signal by your behavior outwardly that the house of God is built within you from its literal words. Um, I've indicated in the Latin that the uh, ablative plural letteris, which if you take literally has to mean something like straws, which I really don't think is what Hugh had in mind, uh, is, uh, is an alternative form for literis, in other words, the literal words of the text. As Hugh writes at the end of his meditation on Noah's Ark, this pictura serves as a summary for that longer treatise. Such picturing has also been called visual exegesis, and the assumption is also sometimes made that ekphrastic texts must always describe a real artifact that has now been lost. I think this is very common, I've encountered in art history in particular. Uh, but I think it's a usage that comes up in the Renaissance, but it is not, in fact, particularly a medieval usage. Because descriptio or pictura, and the words are synonymous, in medieval rhetoric, applies to any and all descriptions of an artifact, real or imagined. Indeed, in medieval literature, far more frequently imagined, as, for example, the artworks that regularly pop up in medieval romances, vernacular and Latin, and those of you who read any of them will be familiar with these. Pictura is a genre of medieval literature and also a figure of thought in medieval rhetoric. I would also caution that as the term visual exegesis has come to be used over the last 40 years, it's often been misapplied to this kind of literary um, ekphrasis. Hugh's pamphlet about Noah's Ark inspired several similar ekphrastic works, 
composed within a generation of it, chiefly in orders like the Norbertines and the Cistercians, with close ties to both the Victorines and also the Carthusians, which is the other contemplative order that makes a lot of use of this kind of meditative envisioning. So the Benedictine abbot Peter of Sell, who had studied in Paris, in the 1160s composed a contemplative work, De Tabernaculo. The Norbertine canon turned Carthusian Adam of Dryburg composed one De Tripartito Tabernaculo. And Richard of St. Victor, a generation after Hugh, composed his De Contemplazione Maior, his large text on contemplation, sometimes now known as the Benjamin Major, which became for the later Middle Ages the great guide to the traditions of monastic contemplation. He composed this by using the Ark of the Tabernacle, complete with the two cherubim that surmount it, as his structuring device. None of these texts contain material pictures. And these works are not exegesis, at least not the usual understanding. And that is, their goal is not the, applica I'm sorry, the explication of the biblical text by means of glosses of the words, excerpts from earlier commentaries, and so on. Although literal explication of exactly this sort was also a major project of the 12th century. Richard of St. Victor himself wrote a number of literal commentaries on the Bible text, including an influential one on Ezekiel that contained several paintings of the structures and plan of the temple in order to explicate the text of the Bible. And here from one manuscript of these, of just two of a large number of uh, such pictures, painted pictures, in this particular text. <coughs> this kind of exegesis, together with many paintings and drawings of exactly this sort, culminated after a century or so in the vast commentary on the whole Bible compiled by the 14th century Franciscan Nicholas of Lyra. Such material is properly called exegesis, and indeed visual exegesis because it's to aid you in, 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 in a literal commentary uh, and envisioning of the words of the text. But envisioned verbal pictures of the sort that Hugh composes in his Descriptio of Noah's Ark has a wholly different goal. It does not explain the Bible text. Rather, it takes off from the topical locations the text can provide in order to create new compositions, using some details from the Bible and a very great many more that he's made up as its dispositive locations for inventing his own arguments. For example, he worries about the amphibians in the ark. And so he imagines compartments um, that are built into the sides of the ark so that the amphibians will be all right. <laughs> And he says, I know that's not in the Bible, but you know. <laughs> in other words, in Cicero's phrase, Hugh uses the plan of the ark as given in Genesis as a method of inventing, as an ars inveniendi, for his own philosophical meditations and counsels about monastic life, the church, and salvation history. That is a very different from the goal of biblical exegesis. And I mentioned I brought this picture, uh, this slide from, from Richard's uh, commentary up precisely because when Richard wants to do visual literal exegesis, he can. And these pictures are uh, copied in every single manuscript of the work that I'm familiar with. Very different from what happens uh, with Hugh, with the, uh, I'm sorry, with Richard's uh, mystical arc. Let's examine another example of 12th century meditational picturing. And this is Peter of Sell in his, this is the, the preface to his Tractatus de Tabernaculo, which uses as its device the Ark of the Tabernacle as described in Exodus 25. This text incidentally is available now in the Library of Latin Texts. Uh, it was very difficult to get hold of for a while. It hadn't been properly edited, but it is up online now. In his preface, Peter discusses the nature and sequence of his preliminary procedures for composing his treatise. 
First, he carefully imagines the wooden structure plank by plank. Quoting here, truly the tabernacle about which we propose to write is not manufactured, that is not of this natural order, but is wondrous, is celestial, spiritual, angelic, perpetual. Nonetheless, we place before your eyes, pri oculis ponamos, that that earthly one of Moses fabricated by earthly work, and transferring our attention, or intention, you can translate the word either way, transferring our intention from visible things to invisible ones with a whole heart, we ascend toward the east above the heaven of heavens, singing, blessed are those who dwell in your house, O Lord. And indeed, using a plain and pedestrian style, that is what would be known as plain style, actually, in rhetoric, and there's a pun, because <laughs> Peter, like so many of these guys, is never really plain style. <laughs> um, so it's a style, stilo, and also a stylus, of course. Uh, in a plain and pedestrian style, I set out my subject matters within the fabric of the tabernacle. Now indeed, as though having tried building with a real axe, the individual parts of the future fabric, we place before our eyes the very words of the law, again, driving from Exodus 25, and in our own fashion, we construct or construe the mystical or moral house. In other words, we use this compositional geometry to construe in our own fashion, and I think that's very important in here, this mystical or tropological meditation upon the words of God's law, the sort of allegorized mystical meditation built upon the literal ornaments and measurements of the Exodus Ark, the gilded timbers, the ch cherubim, the rings, the poles, and so on, that in fact served to organize Peter's whole tractatus. In his treatise on the same Exodus object, it became particularly popular in the later 12th century, Richard of St. Victor uses the same composing strategy, applying it to the stages of his argument. And again, I've given you the text on the handout. For example, first he says, we must consider what the sides of the ark represent. In our ark, we make two sides opposite to each other, the one being fairness, the other iniquity. I'm using Grover Zinn's translation here, although I would actually prefer to, to translate it as righteousness, one being righteousness and the other iniquity. Then we make the other two sides in direct opposition to each other, the one being success and the other misfortune. If you want to take a piece of paper out and sketch along, you're quite welcome to do that. <laughs> okay, so we have a square, right? And we've got opposites on the two sides um, that are vertical and the two sides that are horizontal. Where success and iniquity meet, I'm sorry, where misfortune and iniquity meet, they form one corner of our imaginary arc. Where success and iniquity meet, they form the second corner. The meeting of fairness or righteousness and success constitutes the third, and that of righteousness and misfortune, the fourth. Does the beginning look a little familiar to you? Okay, if not, it'll come, come along. Okay. At the first corner, the iniquitous meet misfortune. At the fourth corner, opposite, diagonally opposite, the righteous are strengthened. At the second corner, the iniquitous are abandoned by God. At the third, the righteous are sustained by God. And then Richard goes on to augment these basic topics with various moral arguments. The iniquitous are reproved by misfortune but remain in their iniquity because they're iniquitous, right? Um, and yet, although they meet misfortune, the righteous overcome it and advance towards the good. When the iniquitous meet success, they stay iniquitous. While the righteous meet success, they are defended and strengthened by their faith. Now, in case you hadn't recognized it, this is, of course, a variant of the syllogistic square of opposition. But imagined in terms of the four corners of the Exodus arc and for moral and rhetorical purposes not dialectic ones. There's a great deal more geometry like this in Richard's treatise. 
Indeed, at the end of the treatise, he calls himself the Bezalel of his work, after the ancient architect of the biblical tabernacle. But Richard's ark building, of course, is all in the mind. As I said, you can always do little sketches on your wax tablet or your spare paper if you wish to. An even grander envisioning, created not long after Richard's mystical art treatise, occurs among the visions in Hildegard of Bingen's Shivyas. And I think this is familiar to a number of people here. So, this is the third part of Shivyas, around 1175, so 15 years or so after Peter of Sel, uh, and almost contemporary with Richard of St. Victor. This, many of you know, the, 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 the manuscript, these are drawings that were made, drawings and paintings that were made uh, in, in, a, in a manuscript that was made at her convent, but now it's missing. It has been missing since World War II. Okay, this vision too is an architectural complex containing several other diagram shapes, including towers, columns, uh, one is square, one is round, and one is triangular. Some ladders, an angel, a set of painted vaults, and a majesty. Like Hugh's Ark, it too is basically a cubic quadrature enclosed within a greater roundness. It has often been observed that geometric shapes in the paintings are just rather askew. Uh, this is, of course, because earthly geometry will never quite get to divine geometry. In her introduction to the English translation of Shivyas, Barbara Newman gives a detailed summary of this particular vision, uh, and I refer you to it as indeed to her work on Hildegard more generally. Hildegard knew Hugh of St. Victor's work on Noah's Ark, for she quotes from it. But unlike that and most other such works, Hildegard's envisionings were from the start drawn and painted, indeed more often than once twice within her lifetime, including the famous manuscript made at her own monastery of Rupertsburg and now apparently lost. And Hildegard is thought, indeed she says, that she supervised these particular paintings. They're not professional work. They do not make use of painters' models. As Newman says, the Rupertsburg artists were likely nuns of the convent who worked under the visionary's personal supervision. I'm quoting from Barbara Newman there. Yes, but. Another manuscript of Shivyas, now in Heidelberg, was painted also during Hildegard's lifetime. And its paintings are somewhat different, in fact, rather different, as indeed the paintings of the Rupertsburg manuscript differ in many details from Hildegard's verbal picturae. It's worth querying just what in this context supervision might mean. And in pondering this question, a comment by Mother Placid Dempsey who designed and painted the illustrations for the 1990 English translation, seems to me quite relevant. She says that to her, Hildegard's personal supervision meant both the detailed process of envisioning that Hildegard so vividly describes in her text, and through her words, invites others to carry out, and also how such an understanding of such supervisioning brings together in community, quote, many persons to share and creatively carry out that vision, quote, quote. Shivyas does not, in other words, offer a portfolio of my paintings to be exactly reproduced over and over again. The 12th century visionary's goal is pastoral, to encourage others in her care carefully to undertake, as they are able, a similar envisioning process using her words as an originating source, fonte sensuum et origines dictionem. Some years ago, Grover Zinn invited us to consider Hugh of St. Victor's great art picture, Pictura, as a kind of Buddhist-style mandala painting, but in words. The analogy seems to be entirely apt, and in making the comparison, I would stress, as Zinn did not, what happens to a mandala picture when the community of monks has finished making it. Because traditionally it is not preserved, it is destroyed. This fact underscores the fundamental value of such communal envisioning, is the process of making is shared 
and the group effort is the goal. It is not best understood as the product of a lone genius. In fact, to do so would be, in terms of those conventions, it would be perverse. And in this way, pictura envisioning could also be compared with group singing, another method by which a monastic household was kept together, and which also is particularly rich among Hildegard's compositions, as you know. Which brings me to another feature of many medieval diagrams. I've been emphasizing, as, many pe as people do, of course, their visual nature, their shape, um, because I'm focused on the inventive nature of their geometries. But medieval diagrams often are to be heard as well as seen. <coughs> Most importantly, they were designed to be drawn into one's mind with the ears and eyes simultaneously. For example, the author of one 12th century discussion of the offices and duties of the various angelic orders appends a diagram to his work. And this is not at all unusual, as we've seen. And it's not a particularly interesting diagram, which is one reason I'm not going to give you a picture of it. But I have given you the text. It is introduced in this way. And again, I'm just going to read the English translation. What I put in red there are the words that I think are particularly uh, significant, for, th for this purpose at any rate. We are appending an exemplar of the angelic organization made in sets of threes, that is the diagram, on which the mind can feed more fully and hold in memory more tenaciously. For with your ears, your mind will draw it in through the word and through the form, scrutinize it with your eyes. So evidently, this monastic teacher intended his diagram to be the basis of oral colloquy as well as silent meditation. And I think that's probably true of all of these diagrams, especially in this 12th century context. Atraho in the Latin, atraxerit, is to draw towards or attract. The way Augustine says in book 11 of his uh, treatise on the Trinity, that the mind is drawn to and intends toward a particular thing that its senses have picked up at the first stage in the communist census of that conceptualizing of sensory data that produces a mental intentio, what we call a notion or a concept. It's worth pondering at length, it seems to me, how greatly the medieval model of cognition, Augustinian and Thomist alike, conceives of consciousness as desire. Our very awareness of the world in which we act comes into being as our desire focuses our various affected senses intently on something we wish to know. It's not anywhere near as intellectual an activity uh, as it has become. In the letter to the monk Guibert of Jean Bleu, in which she describes her life and her visionary techne, Hildegard of Bingen emphasizes how she hears and sees and knows her vision, which I take to mean how she cognizes it, how she knows it to be a truthful sensory experience, not an hallucination, even though she uses only her mental senses, as she says, and not her exterior ones. She says over and over again, simul video et audio et skio, right? At the same time, I hear, I see, and I understand. And then she goes on to say that as though in a moment, in momento, while she, when she, what she cognizes, she also is able to retain. And that's that consolidation of memory uh, that, that neuroscientists still talk about. Um, quasi in momento, hoc quod scio disco, disco. Uh, I learn and remember. Now, Barbara Newman has emphasized that this letter was composed to persuade us of the authenticity and authority of Hildegard's envisionings, to believe her experienced teachings confidently. And clearly within her strongly oral culture, hearing is as important as seeing. And Hildegard is by no means unique in insisting that hearing is essential to seeing and persuading. Think of, for example, how much sound per permeates the divine comedy. So Dante's concept of visibile parlare, visible speaking, was by no means unique. But it's not just highly trained contemplatives who use this sort of imaginary geometry for their composing. A rhetoric master in Bologna in the early 13th century, 
von Campagno da Signa, describes two invention machines in his Rhetorica Novissima, the latest thing in rhetoric, uh, which dates from 1235. And in order to discuss the divisions of knowledge and how they work together, that's the standard divisiones philosophiae that we were looking at on Tuesday, um, he visualizes a large mill building, okay, like a water mill, um, a flour mill. A large mill with 11 geared wheels, 11 large geared wheels and five smaller ones, all grinding together orbicularitaire, or, or orbicularitaire, that's right, revolving, in other words, in circular movements, like a great machina uh, mundialis, which is what he calls it, a world machine. Um, you may remember the world soul in Platonism, well, this is a world machine. And these gear-engaged mill, mill wheels grind the matter of human science like teeth, chewing up the whole into finer and finer pieces as the body of knowledge passes both through and up the structure. So grammar first, then dialectic and rhetoric, arithmetic, geometry, music and astronomy, physica, again as natural philosophy, and then civil law, canon law, and theology at the very top. And as they turn about each other, civil and canon law make a harmonious sound. You do remember that Bologna was famous as a law university. There's probably a message to the faculty in there. <laughs> von Campagno probably expressed a hope rather than a fact. And at the very top of this machine, theology, he says, revolves about a great ladder, that would be Jacob's ladder, though very few, as he notes, either wish or are able to climb it. Now, I might, myself do not want to climb very far through Bon Campagno's knowledge mill, for it is a somewhat odd structure. But I think we can see some parallels between it and the encyclopedically envisioned pictures that we find earlier in the 12th century in the Victorines and those that they influenced, including Hildegard of Bingen. Bon Campagno's Machina Mundialis is a complex edifice with many moving parts, intricately engaged with one another. It comprises more than one type of figure, wheels within wheels, productively geared and meshed together with a tower structure to contain the whole contrivance rising up to theology at the top. The mill trope is common in monastic literature. It goes all the way back to Cassian, uh, who uses it in his conferences as an image for human thought. The human mind, Cassian says, is like a great mill that never ceases working, grinding away equally on chaff and good wheat. So a contemplative monk needs to supply it with good grain in order to produce truthful thoughts. Uh, garbage in, garbage out is a very, very old maxim. <laughs> Elsewhere in the Rhetorica Novissima, Bon Campagno describes a general technique for making an analytical structure, which will not only recall the order of known categories, but can be moved about in itself to create new relationships. Um, this involves imagining a cube, a quadrata, he calls it, projected into a sphere. And Bon Campagno says that a person wishing to analyze the different aspects of any subject should place each individual part marked by a distinctive and thus memorable image in the locations, the loci of this figure, which could yield as many, therefore, as 16, eight sides and eight corners. And then remember the square of oppositions, okay? One then draws lines, linea, he says, amongst these loci, similar to the lines marking relationships shown in the familiar square of opposition, along the sides and across the diagonals. And then the whole contraption, the cube, complete with the images in its various loci, with lines connecting them, and all inside this sphere. And Bon, bon Campagno is very particular that it's the sphere of the sun, that this is in. This whole thing is then rotated to make different and perhaps unexpected combinations of ideas out of its parts. Uh, it sounds peculiar, and Bon Campagno apologizes that the technique is obscure, and he may not have described it very well, which is certainly true. Um, 
And in fact, you could read the translation of it. It's in these, the uh, uh, anthology uh, on the craft of uh, the medieval craft of memory uh, that I did uh, translations that I edited with Jan Zielkowski. One could, in fact, ignore this passage altogether as a piece of early 13th century Bolognese weirdness, um, <laughs> except that similar devices to recollect, invent, and analyze conceptual relationships, which consist of squares projected into circles, became an endearing, enduring feature, it isn't endearing at all, an enduring feature of medieval combinatory logics of the sort most famous to us now from Ramon Lull. Uh, Lul died in 1316, the Spanish mystic and Franciscan preacher. It occurs also over 150 years later in the earliest printed art of memory, composed as part of his Ars Inveniendi by a Catalan humanist by the name of Jacobus Publicius. Um, in the earliest versions of Publicius's Ars Oratoria, and do notice that this is connected now very much with rhetoric. It's not just a matter of, of university logic courses. Um, the Ars Oratoria circulated widely in the decades after its publication in Venice in 1482. A square is printed in woodcut within a set of, of concentric circles, its sides and corners marked with the different letters of the alphabet. Uh, which you see. And notice that there are, uh, well, there are only 15 locations. There should be 16, um, but the Veramis takes up some of it. Um, so it needs to be understood, in other words, as a cube within a sphere. It's not a square within concentric circles only. Or Publicius says, if you don't want to use the letters of the alphabet like this, uh, you can instead use various images in place of the letters, and the book helpfully provided some examples. And in fact, you can see a few of them uh, in the left hand and the left hand side of this particular slide, a few of these images uh, instead of the letter X. And wonderfully, those are exactly some of the images that are on that T-shirt, <laughs> just taken, in fact, from one of these uh, editions. In the middle of the square, the worm-shaped volvel can be rotated to make various combinations from the topics that are placed there. The 1482 version, slightly augmented, was reprinted in 1485 and again in 1490, all by the printer Erhard Rockdolt, who was also the earliest printer of Euclid's elements. I do not think this is a coincidence because of the very long tradition I've been exploring with you in these lectures of coupling geometry with topical invention. Um, as I said in the uh, title of this slide, the volvel is actually separately printed and then cut out by some little lackey in the shop, presumably. Um, it's, a, it's the shape of a worm, uh, because that's the vermis, obviously. Uh, separately printed, it then gets cut out, and then there's a string uh, through the middle of it, and that is what allows it to rotate. And you do get in later, later medieval manuscripts, you can get concentric circles that are attached to the vellum page with a string so that they will rotate as well. Um, I think probably Hugh of St. Victor would have seen this as a concession to poor education, yeah. but there we are. Um, Geometric globes were associated from very early times, perhaps particularly in ancient Platonism, with the cosmic spheres, with their harmonic movements as they rubbed against each other, and indeed with the divine. And always remember that there is no vacuum in the pre-modern universe. Motion always is engendered through direct material contacts. There is no, there is no causation at a distance. The modernist art and film theorist, Rudolf Arnheim, observed in his The Power of the Center that, quote, a sphere or wheel is unrelated to the Cartesian system of linear logic and exempt from its constraints. Arnheim's insight was anticipated, as he himself admitted, by the 12th century view memorably encapsulated by Alan of Lille, that God is a comprehensible sphere 
whose center is everywhere, whose circumference is nowhere. Um, Marie-Thérèse d'Alverny, who is the great editor of Alan of Lille, thinks that this was probably a composition, that is that, that maxim, which is presented as a maxim, as a, as a kind of colophon to the work, uh, was probably really the composition of Alan of Lille. Um, but it picks up uh, in a maxim-like form a very ancient idea uh, about the sphere and the spheres moving with one another. Uh, so I put up as well this uh, brief quotation from the Constellation of Philosophy about the cosmic circles and how they move. Because unlike a quadrature, a rotundity can express at once both the created universe and the creator, as it does in this recently um, restored pavement, the Cosmati pavement in Westminster Abbey. So I'll just go back to the Boethius to pick this up. Um, Consider the example of a number of spheres in orbit around the same central point. The innermost moves toward the simplicity of the center and becomes a kind of hinge about which the outer spheres circle. Whereas the outermost whirling in a wider orbit tends to increase its orbit in space the further it moves from the indivisible midpoint of the center. If, however, it is connected to the center, it is confined by the simplicity of the center and no longer tends to stray into space. And although there's no evidence for this, it did seem to me that Boethius may be somewhere in the back of this particular extraordinary uh, mosaic uh, pavement. It's, it's opus sestile stonework, and the craftsmen and materials all came from Rome. It is now uh, in front of the high altar in Westminster Abbey, uh, right in front of, of Edward the Confessor. Um, and I recommend to you this website or from Westminster Abbey will tell you all about it. Um, but I want right now to, to concentrate in particular on the original inscriptions, which are lost now, but they are basically lost. But they were in brass letters around the pavement. They were, it was recorded in the 15th century. It's completely gone now. The original brass inscriptions for this extraordinary stone diagram invited the lector, the reader, to revolve wisely the matters placed and joined up here, that is, in the pavement, in order to discover, in Vaniat, the goal, which is how I translate terminus. I don't think this actually is necessarily about the end of the world. I think, rather, it's about creation. The terminus, the goal of the first mover, namely the created globe itself. In other words, the pavement is presented as a book to be read, revolved mentally in contemplation, of course, but also revolved physically by walking around and within it. It is essential that globes and spheres revolve. In ordinary Latin, the word circulus, circulus basically just means going around and could apply to any circular movement. For instance, in classical Latin, a circulator was a sort of town crier or an itinerant storyteller who gathered people around him. Uh, Circulus was also applied very early to the celestial circuits, the zodiac and the ecliptic, through which the heavenly bodies move. They are always in constant movement. So motion is inherent in the very definition of circle, uh, a motion that returns on itself, as the Latin preposition circa suggests. Moreover, a sphere was considered to be a universal shape, as also the shape of the universe. So it's both universal and the universe. When medieval philosophers talk about how the universe shows the divine creator's work, they're not only talking about its features and denizens as recounted in Genesis, but also considering its fundamental geometry. Martianus Capella's Lady Geometry characterizes the sphere as, quote, containing all figures within itself. It consists of circles into which it is resolved, containing all figures within itself. And for this reason, capable of infinite creativity using the geometries of our human world too. And I do think this is one reason why in things like Shivyas, the quadrature is enclosed within the circle um, because all of that is con contained within 
Um, for unlike trees and ladders, wheels readily interact with other wheels. They can form conjunctions that are not only uniform, but crucially can change with speed of motion as mill wheels do as machinae. And as spheres rotate concentrically, the outer more slowly than the inner ones, they are capable of forming new combinations. They are an obvious means of combinatory logics. And indeed, from the late 14th century at least, this property was exploited in diagrams that have moving parts, like the one in Jacobus's rhetoric, as a means of greatly expanding the range of possibilities for compositional invention. Well, we've considered three-dimensional quadratures and rotundities as instruments of tropical invention. And I know that the announcement for this talk mentioned hands, but time is short, and hands have been masterfully covered by scholars like Claire Richter Sherman and Faith Wallace on hands for calendrical computus, and Carl, Ber Carl Berger on the Gidonian hand, for example, for music, and among many others for that matter. So instead, I'd like very briefly to engage with another solid shape, namely triangularities, chiefly in the form of a triangular prism or tetrahedron. Hildegard describes one such shape in her envisioning of the church. For in one corner of the walled square building I showed you earlier is a dark three-sided column that she identifies as the column of the Trinity. It's a prism, though obscure in its visualization, as befits the doctrine of the Trinity. But triangularity demonstrates in a way humans can readily grasp how it's possible to be both three and one at the same time. Moreover, the observation that a tetrahedral prism breaks up white light into many colors also made it particularly attractive as a demonstration of how a singularity can create multitudes a property meditated on at length during the 12th and 13th centuries by, for example, Robert Grosstest, the Oxford physicist and Bishop of Lincoln. It is also true that the triangle is one of the basic shapes, along with quadrature, for earthly measurement. So that squares, quadratures can be resolved into triangles and triangles made into quadratures. And in fact, it's even used, although not quite, uh, for measuring the arcs, uh, the triangles within a hemisphere to measure the arc uh, of the circle. This is true in Roman, uh, well, Greco-Roman geometry, and that carries on straight through. But this geometrically enabled instrument for Trinitarian composition was still well appreciated at the end of the 16th century, as you can see from this extraordinary tetrahedral tower of wisdom built in Rushton in Northamptonshire. It was designed deliberately to evoke the Trinity by a defiant Catholic, Sir Thomas Tresham. And some of you perhaps have seen it, and if you haven't, it is certainly well worth the visit. Uh, and you can find out a great deal more about it, including a plan of the architecture uh, on a web page devoted to it through English heritage. Through its many inscriptions, which play throughout on the number three, partly as a pun on his name, Trace Ham, home of three, the building itself presents a readable, if concealed, set of arguments for his Catholic belief, a material bringing before the eyes witness for his confident faith. I should also point out something that uh, Peter Stallybrass reminded me of earlier, uh, that um, as a kind of cover, I think, it was, uh, uh, it was, it was announced as being a, uh, a, a warren uh, uh, for rabbits. And I refer you to the picture I showed you on Tuesday of, uh, of, of, of that very standard image, uh, uh, invention image of finding the concealed rabbits. <coughs> Well, in 1570, the first translation of Euclid in English was published in London together with an extensive mathematical preface by the Elizabethan polymath John Dunn, uh, John Dee, rather, sorry, an advisor to the Queen who, as a young man, lectured in Paris on the subject of geometry. 
He praises arithmetic in this preface as a means by which we can, quote, arise, climb, ascend, and mount up with speculative wings in spirit, even to the highest heaven, to understand divine matters such as the Trinity. And then he writes, and this is what I'm giving you here, geometry is the knowledge of that which is everlasting. It will lift up, therefore, O gentle sir, our mind to the verity, and by that means it will prepare the thought to the philosophical love of wisdom, that we may turn or convert toward heavenly things both mind and thought. Chiefly, therefore, commandment must be given, that such as do inhabit this most honorable city of London by no means despise geometry. And since I can't say any better than John D, God knows about the uh, virtues of geometry. On that note, I close these lectures and simply say thank you. Okay. He said that um, he's worked a lot on uh, Nicholas Rakuza, and he says Rakuza, um, Minsura is what mind comes from, which ah. fits very nicely with what you've been talking about tonight. Yes. And I wondered, have you run across that anywhere? Not in what I've been looking at, but I really sort of stop in the mid-13th century for a lot of this. I mean, I, I got as far as the derivaciones. It's not in, 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 in Hugo Zione of Pisa, and that's around, what, to about 1200. But it doesn't surprise me in the least, and it's a wonderful etymology to add to the whole mix. Be yeah. Yes, exactly, exactly. And men's cure. Absolutely. And it fits in with what John Dee is saying here, you know, that this is the means by which you mount to the divine. Yeah. Um, thank you, first of all, for a, a triad of wonderful lectures. Um, uh, my question uh, is about uh, this practice of group envisioning that you mentioned and mm -hmm. kind of likened it to a mandala. And so, um, I guess I, I, I wonder if you have any thoughts about the kind of what you see as what, how you envision this sort of social practice of uh, imagining these diagrams as a group. Is it something that is oral? Are there sort of diagrams literally drawn in the sand? I mean, we have the manuscript tradition, but um, are there sort of ephemeral ways of demonstrating diagrams that, that, um, that don't survive? Do we have evidence for it, or, or is there can you imagine how it might have occurred? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I can imagine it being read out in a, in a monastic colloquy, for example. Uh, and I can certainly more than just imagine it. I'm quite sure that various ephemeral surfaces could have been used to draw this, because in fact, that's standard. Uh, and the word abacus <laughs> refers not only to the beads on and, and the, the, the arithmetical kind of, of computation, but an abacus is a sand table, basically. That's one of its basic meanings in Latin. And in fact, in um, Martianus Capella, Lady Geometry carries an abacus with her so that she can draw the figures on the sand. Um, and well, later, when paper was more available, I'm sure people used paper as well for this kind of thing. I think the it's. You're right to, to, to uh, stress the notion of the if relative ephemerality of the surface. I think that's the key thing. Because it isn't the fact of whether you draw it or not that's important. Um, and in fact, for the first time I read uh, Hugh of St. Victor's Ark, I think everybody has this experience, I wanted to draw it. I couldn't see it otherwise. Um, but I drew it on a yellow pad. And I'm sure that insofar as um, there was a commentary on this particular picture of Hughes, it would have been drawn, those figures would have been drawn on an abacus, which would have been a surface that was absolutely familiar to them. And do you know that, um, I didn't bring the picture with me, but there's a very famous 
sort of so-called so self-portrait of Hildegard of Bingen in composition. And you notice that next to her, she has a stylus in her hand, uh, but next to her is a whole set of wax tablets, right? That's an ephemeral medium. And the fact that she may have drawn it or not, I mean, it's also, of course, a metonym, very famous metonym for the memory, uh, is like a, like a wax tablet. Um, so that, that image actually very neatly gets together uh, this aspect of composition. And you also remember, perhaps, in this particular picture, that the scribe, who has his vellum book in his hand and his stylus, is outside and listening very clearly. He's got a sort of this big ear coming around before he actually writes down. So I think it shows the stages of, of textualizing, I think, very well, that particular picture. Mary, this was just marvelous. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I was so moved by the idea of geometry as a dynamic force with the circles and squares, with the cubes and the spheres that have a kind of infinite productivity, mm. which, of course, is continuous with the notion of invention. But I wondered also, um, I, I, I was reminded, surprisingly, in the middle of this, of one moment at which a geometrical figure is used as a containing um, mm -hmm. a, a dynamic as opposed to an infinitely productive dynamic. Um, so the example that I have, and it may simply be because it's 13th century and scholastics just don't like infinite productivity. They like to come back to the center. Yeah. But it's an amazing geometrical figure that's used by the um, a 13th century gloss on the Nautis, where they're, they're, they're so anxious about, the, about figurative speech. What does figurative speech actually do? And so he uses the idea of a straight line, mm -hmm. um, which has an oblique um, attached to it. And what that straight line is doing is it has rectitude, and that's the thing that you're referring to. And then the figure is that oblique, and it kind of moves away in an arc from the straight line, mm -hmm. and but it has to come back to the straight line. That's the point. It's actually contained or restricted by the straight line. Mm -hmm. So there you have this geometrical principle that's being imposed, if anything, to restrict the productive uh, uh, dynamism, right? Um, and so I don't know if that's specifically scholastic, because that's just their anxiety. It almost seemed to me, though, that in the quotation from Boethius, there's something implicit yes. in Boethius's um, uh, depiction of the of the heavens that they they whirl around but then they come but they're held That's by right. the center. That's and it right. seems to me that there's a there's an element in that that could be picked up by later thinkers who are actually worried about a kind of infinite production of meaning or an infinite production of forms. Well I think I think actually that does come a bit earlier. It's not it's not um, I wouldn't say it was original with scholastics, although whatever they Useful they put put it to would perhaps be, but it's wonderfully um, defined in that quote I gave you from Peter of Sell on Tuesday. I think it was on Tuesday. It may have been on Monday. I don't remember. Um, when he's talking about the six s sides of the cell, within that limitation, yes. the mind is free to wander, etc. So I think always there's that tension. It's a, but it's seen as a creative tension between restraint and the ability to invent. Um, if it were totally infinite, then I don't think that, for example, you could characterize the arts of memory, uh, spontaneous recollection, as abusive. It's abusive because it violates the laws. I mean, it, and therefore, it is, not, it is not genuinely productive. It's too haphazard and so on. So there's always that, that tension between the totally haphazard uh, and, you know, wild, let's say, uh, and the need for productive restraint, which is, after all, what a solid geometric figure, no matter what its shape is, does. It is a productive restraint. Thank you.
Yes, I do, actually. <laughs> I do, Michael. <laughs> and you underscore a very important feature of all of medieval culture, which I'm trying to get across, but more briefly, and that is the oral dimension of medieval culture. I mean, we've got to keep that in mind all the time, that there is no, it is very rare um, for, for silent meditation, silent reading as regarded as preparation for a, a, an oral communal performance of one, or colloquy of some sort or another. Uh, and that's very important. As I said, I mean, the diagrams do need to be heard um, as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. I just want to add uh, another set of actors to your depiction, which are uh, the Kabbalists, uh, uh, mainly in Spain, but perhaps more than that, in the sense that they do use a lot of uh, geometry, including this yep. uh, square in the circle, and also the dot and the linear, uh, the line, and so on, and very extensively, and, and again, uh, almost without any pictures at, at that stage. Later on, it becomes much more uh, mm -hmm. explicitly graphic, mm -hmm. but as a, a visual depiction, uh, uh, which is entirely in the mind. Yes. Uh, so I think that's an interesting uh, prophet. Oh. Uh, and one small question is regarding the, uh, uh, the um, anthropology or epistemology of imagination, the ambivalence in medieval scholastic towards it, and does that find any uh, mark uh, in, in, in what you're looking at? Okay, let me take this the Spanish Kabbalah first. Uh, I'm beginning to think now very much that um, Ramon Lul, who, um, as I said, is the early 14th century, uh, and uh, Catalan, I do believe, um, has often been presented, uh, presented as though he were totally original and nothing like this has ever been done before. Um, I no longer think that that's true. I haven't thought that was true for quite a long time, actually. Um, but it is very interesting to me that there's a set of often Spanish friars with Spanish connections that come in in the, in the 14th century. And again, there happens to be uh, a translation of a bit of it by a, a, a Catalan Franciscan by the name of uh, Francis Hesmenus. Uh, and Jacobus Publicius, which is, as far as I can see, a made up name. I mean, uh, but he seems to have come also from Spain and specifically from Catalonia. So there seems to have been some sort of center for this kind of study, um, probably orally transmitted in, from, from Spain. But by no means is it, is it confined to Spain. Okay, I mean, it, it's, it's, you can find it much more broadly uh, in uh, um, monastic cultures really from the very beginning. Um, hmm? Also communal. 
Yes. Yes. Now know that these are groups that. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's just very much a, a matter of of a. You have a small community, um, and. Uh, it is a way of community building. I mean, if you leave the religious element out of it, which you hardly can do, but I mean, it really is, we tend to think of it entirely in terms of individual invention of sermons, et cetera, for other purposes. But for the purpose, very much a creative purpose of creating a community, it's also extremely important, it seems to me. Please, sir. I could go back to the Westminster. Uh, yes, 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 yes. Um, um, because I was fascinated by your Boethius quote about how the spheres, the, the outer spheres, have a tendency to whirl out of control mm -hmm. uh, and whirl away. And I'm mm. fast, I've always been fascinated by where these mosaics, that they're connected. In other words, they're not separate. You actually get the, the way in which the square uh, in the middle mm -hmm. goes out and round. Mm -hmm. So it mm -hmm. actually holds them. Holds them together, um, that's right, yes. And I was thinking back to your notion of when you actually were presenting um, in the first and second lectures about the, about the brain. And again, what you've got is this notion of separate areas, but interconnections. Again. Yes. So again, these are actual interconnections. Right, right. They literally link with each other in yeah. a way that they don't relate to separate. Yeah. So I just wondered if you saw any connection between this kind of diagram and this kind of flowchart, in a way, it is like a flowchart. Uh, and the flowchart that you were saying sort of disappears in the in the Renaissance uh, map, where you're getting something nearer to uh, faculty psychology. In in the brain, yes, as, as it begins to turn into more yeah. what we know of as as faculty psychology. Yeah, I've always been interested in those lines as well that draw it in towards that central uh, sphere here. And of course, this is this is not just to be found in this particular. Pavement, and it's very, very common. Um, and I, not, I also wonder if in Bon Campagno's notion that you have to draw lines around the, um, um, the topics, and then you whirl them. He says it's like a line, and I wonder somewhat if, if this is also a representation of that. But it is very much a connected geometry. That's quite true. And instead of thinking of confinement, I would think of as more like tension. So almost like, almost like gravity, <laughs> um, there have been ideas amongst Dantes for some time that Dante had some vague idea of geometry. He called it love, of course, but, but this, this sort of attraction throughout the universe that is both expansive and constantly uh, bringing in as well. It's a very fundamental uh, pre-modern idea, pre-enlightenment, -pre I would say, idea. I have to ask you about Hildegard. Okay. Um, that, that structure is called the edifice of salvation, right? I get back there. Yes, and I think so. I think, if, if I remember reading book three, well, I haven't read it for a long time, but I think I remember that if you go around it, starting in one corner and go around, you go through all of the um, ages of human mm -hmm. That's right. creation to the eschaton. Yeah. So there's a temporal element in it, too. Yeah. And the castle is kind of holding all of time together. Yep. And and all within the uh, rotundity, uh, within the round sphere there. Yes, exactly. That dark thing in the corner, bottom corner there, that's the that's the tetrahedron of the Trinity. Of the Trinity. Yeah. I think the uh, wing thing in the corner is, is something that has to do with the eschaton. Yes, it does. It's a, I think it's a seraph, um, if I'm remembering correctly. Uh, each element in this, I mean, and this is sort of like the, um, like the, the overview, the summary image, except it comes at the beginning. And then and subsequently in this third part, Hildegard does uh, an, a more detailed uh, moralizing and imagining of each of the elements in turn. The other thing about this that I find really very interesting, and when I first saw this, I thought this is weird, because she really emphasizes the corners. And Christ is the cornerstone. And Christ is the cornerstone, that's right, exactly. But you could also see this as yet another adaptation of a square of oppositions, basically. 
without the, that kind of logical element in it. And you can see very clearly in here also that, that what uh, Madeleine Calvin has picked up about Hildegard's geometry, which is it's always just slightly askew because after all, it is not measuring the earth. It's a divine geometry. Can I thank your indulgence and just go back to the cosmosity? The cosmosity, okay. Because I think it's about, um, there we are. It's about quadratures as well as about circles. Mm. And um, it's, it's classically Pythagorean with the, with this, with, with this, the hypotenuse of the mm -hmm. triangle. So this, mm -hmm. this length will be the same as this length. Mm -hmm. And this cube will be exactly half the cube mm -hmm. around mm -hmm. it. So, mm -hmm. the, so the spheres are playing with the, with the, with the, with the cubes at the same time. Absolutely, absolutely. And the squares can be resolved into triangles, and the triangles meet into squares. I mean, it's that again. It's that wonderfully um, productive. Uh, use of various dimensions, and it was, it, this is absolutely fascinating. I'm so glad that they actually cleaned it. I don't know whether they let you look at it still, but, <laughs> but you can, as I said, examine it on the website. There, it's well worth doing, spending time with. Yeah. Um, just tangentially, I was really happy to see the spinning worm, the, the primitive color reader, because it reminded me of the Americanists talking about the wildly popular. Pop-up books, spinning books. Yes. That were among the precursors of cinema. Yeah. So my question was about the explosion of these attempts to make these drawings, the historical explosion. Mm -hmm. And it's reminded me of some sort of like what happened in the humanities under the influence of the Industrial Revolution. Mm -hmm. And I wonder what, and I have a thought to produce with this, but I wonder what material conditions during that time might have caused that, and I thought we did, because if you think of the technology of the boom, mm -hmm. and also the constraint, and also all these oppositions, mm -hmm. the embeddings we've been talking about, mm -hmm. it seems like not theory, and in particular, in some instances, the constraint instance has came up in the way, like Oromian knots, those uniquely kind of interdependent and then not interdependent at all knots. Yeah. Well, I think there is a connection there, and I'm glad you brought up weaving because I've actually been in touch with some people in uh, the Netherlands who are working on historical um, looms and and the the geometry and arithmetic of that uh, as a model of well, a model model is it's, it's as a um, depiction of the mind at work, basically, um, and a kind of combinatory logic of a very very practical sort. Um, and as for the kinds of conditions in the, we might say the demographic conditions in the 12th century, yes, of course, there's an expansion of the audience. So you're moving from a monastic audience, which is small uh, and, uh, and contained, into a much larger city audience, much more um, and much more engaged with the laity than it was before, et cetera, et cetera. And that simply continues on through the Middle Ages. You can write the history, and people have, God knows, uh, of, of, the, of the monastic traditions entirely in terms of how it moves out into the world. And inevitably changes somewhat that way, but it's very much demography, demographically driven, it seems to me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.